Uh, your slides are right there. Speak to the mic, and it's on this computer. All right. At CCE, we're entering phase four, so we've had a lot of turnover recently. We have a new lead PI, Kathy Barbeau, and a lot of new early career scientists who are joining the project as some of our other people have transitioned off. We're continuing the main focus of our program, but we've got some new core foci for phase four, which is a focus on some of the new extratropical marine heat waves that have been a major disturbance in our system, a greater focus on ecological stoichiometry, and a greater look at variability in top-down forcing in our ecosystem. When it comes to spatial scaling, it's important to keep in mind that the California current ecosystem has a huge productivity gradient. This shows annual surface chlorophyll in our region. And it, our region really spans most of the global variability in productivity in the open ocean. And so we often use what we call a space for time approach to use our spatial variability to try and assess how things will change in time. And this just now zooms out to the global oceans. So you can see the offshore region of our domain is actually not that far off the average chlorophyll out in the middle of the open ocean Pacific. One of the structuring ways that we look at our ecosystem is by comparing things to the nitrocline depth. The nitrocline depth is basically a proxy for nutrient supply to the ecosystem. Deep nitrocline, low nutrient supply. So the graph on the left has been one of our fun um, fundamental ways of looking at the ecosystem. It shows chlorophyll as a function of nitrocline depth, and we see that there's a strong relationship when there's a lot of nutrient supply, there's a lot of chlorophyll. That makes sense. More recently, we've been able to start looking at how communities vary with respect to nitrocline depth. So the graph on the right there is from a recent paper looking at populations of archaea, bacteria, cyanobacteria, eukaryotic phytoplankton, and heterotrophic protists. And for all those different communities, what we find is that the nitrocline depth is the variable that explains most of the changes in the community. And even if we scale out, looking all the way now, I'm taking the red dots there, actually from the Hawaii Ocean Time Series out of Hawaii, we find that our relationship with chlorophyll basically follows all the way out to Hawaii. So for understanding microbial processes, we can, under, we can use this basic relationship of nutrient supply to understand at least within this latitudinal range, how the ocean's behaving. So that's one example of spatial scaling that works well. Here's another example of spatial scaling. In this case, we're looking at sinking carbon exports, so sinking particles that transport carbon out of the surface ocean and into the deep ocean, and comparing that to net primer productivity. On the y-axis here, I've got export efficiency, so that's the proportion of the primary productivity that gets exported. So what we find in our region is that there's an inverse correlation. When there's high net primary productivity, a low proportion of that primary productivity gets exported. And again, we can compare to what we see out at the Hawaii Ocean Time Series site, and their data doesn't fall on our relationship. They basically have low export efficiency and low primary productivity. So the relationship that we have doesn't hold um, over broader areas. So what's going on? Well, a lot of it comes down to the fact that our system is so advective. The water's moving. We have upwelling that transports water from the coast to further offshore. The uh, animation that I have on the right there shows particles that shows a simulation of particles released at one of our study locations on one of our cruises. And you see them spreading throughout the domain. They're spreading a couple hundred kilometers before they sink to a depth of 100 meters in some cases. So really, this is redistributing the nutrients, the productivity, the biomass, the communities, everything across our ecosystem. And when thinking about how advective our ecosystem is, we need to consider the temporal lags between a response and the driver. When we think about our microbial processes, our microbial processes are relatively fast. The generation times of our phytoplankton are on the order of days, same thing for our bacterial populations. So we see rapid turnover. And so when we're measuring our microbial communities and comparing them to the driver of nutrient supply, we see strong correlations. When we're looking at something like export flux, we've actually looked at the temporal lags and we found that there's something like almost a two week lag between when particles are produced in the surface ocean and when they leave the surface ocean. And the two week lags that we're seeing are corresponding to distances traveled of sometimes hundreds of kilometers. So the particles that are being produced near the coast are actually being exported farther offshore. 
So when we want to look at the functional relationships driving the ecosystem, we need to consider these temporal lags and integrate over the um, long-term trajectory of a water parcel as it's traveling through our ecosystem. That's what I've got. Thanks, Mike. That was beautiful, um, both visually beautiful and scientifically beautiful. Um, we have Ken Dutton up next with the actual BLE talk. <laughs> All right. Um, 